July, 1863. Robert E. Lee is on the offensive, moving the front of the Eastern Theater of the Civil War from Confederate Virginia into Union, Pennsylvania. We will zoom in to South Central Pennsylvania. The Battle of Gettysburg began on July 1, 1863. Forward Union forces took positions northwest and north of town. They were hit by Confederate forces, and the rebels pushed the Union lines through town. The Yankees take positions on high ground southeast of town. As night falls, the armies grow in size. On the following morning, July 2nd, Union forces extend along high ground in the shape of a fish hook. The line begins at the barb of the fish hook at Culp's Hill to the right, highlighted in yellow. The line follows along the bend of the fish hook as it rises at Cemetery Hill. Cemetery Ridge runs along the straight shank of the fish hook. On the afternoon of July 2nd, General Sickles moves his corps off Cemetery Ridge to high ground at a peach orchard. He did this without orders, and other generals are unsure of his motives. Meanwhile, Captain Hall of the U.S. Army Signal Corps is stationed on Little Round Top. He catches a glimpse of large numbers of Confederate troops moving behind the cover of ridges and trees beyond Seminary Ridge. He sends word to General Meade that the rebels are on the move. Hall's signal station is the only Union presence on Little Round Top, that hill on the extreme left flank of the Union Army. And then at 4 p.m., General Longstreet appears from behind Seminary Ridge, directly facing Sickles' exposed position. Longstreet sees the undefended heights of Little Round Top and Big Round Top. Longstreet has asked Robert E. Lee for permission to go around the Union flank and take the undefended heights. If the rebels can get artillery on those heights, they will be able to enfilade the entire Union position straight down Cemetery Ridge. But Lee says no. His plan is to strike up the Emmitsburg Road to hit the Federals on Cemetery Ridge. Lee is not interested in the round tops. Longstreet follows orders telling General Hood to move his division against Sickles. But Hood also notices the undefended heights. Hood wants to take the heights, but Longstreet informs Hood to advance up the Emmitsburg Road. Hood protests. Longstreet informs him again that General Lee has ordered the attack to strike up the Emmitsburg Road. Hood begins his attack, moving towards Sickles' lines at the Peach Orchard, Wheat Field, and Devil's Den. As the fighting begins between Longstreet and Sickles, one of Hood's brigade commanders, General Law, also sees the undefended heights. Let's take a closer look at the action that will now occur on the extreme left flank of the Union Army. The Park Service has maintained the landscape to match the historical landscape. Big Round Top is wooded, but Little Round Top is partially deforested. The western slope of Little Round Top is rocky, but clear of timber. The eastern face of Little Round Top, however, is wooded. A second satellite image shows the round tops in the summer, and you can see the foliage cover here. Historical images sometimes show the western slope, which is rocky, but clear. The other side of the hill is wooded. Looking at the topographical map, we can see that Big Round Top at 760 feet is 100 feet higher than Little Round Top at 66 feet. The crests of the two hills are just under one half a mile apart from each other. It is 4 o'clock. The engineer, Governor Warren, gets onto Little Round Top. He sees to his horror, rebel units approaching the undefended heights. He has Hall's station signal for help. Warren hustles to find any outfits that can cover the heights. Not much later, Hood's division is approaching Devil's Den just below the heights. 
two Alabama regiments from Law's Brigade are actually on Big Round Top. 15th Alabama under Oates and the 47th Alabama under Bulger. The regiments have just driven the second U.S. sharpshooters from the area of Big Round Top. The Alabamians take a look from their high vantage point on Big Round Top and they can see the signal men below on Little Round Top flapping a signal flag for help. Law's Alabama regiments on Big Round Top are tired. It is worth noting that they woke up at 3 a.m. that morning and marched 25 miles. As soon as they arrived on the battlefield, they were sent into action, where they now stand on the big hill. It is a hot July day, and they are winded. Oates, commander of the 15th Alabama, tells his men to sit and rest. Oates wants to hold the big round top, get cannon up on the heights and shell the Union lines. But Law sends word that he must advance the regiments to Little Round Top. Let's go in closer. The Alabamians push forward, already running on empty. This is a critical moment. In the valley between the two heights, three more rebel regiments join. These outfits are the 4th Alabama under Scruggs, and then from Robertson's brigade, there is the 4th Texas under Key and the 5th Texas under Powell. In the short time that these men roll down Big Round Top and begin to ascend Little Round Top, the situation on Little Round Top has changed. While the rebels have been moving to Little Round Top, Governor Warren has been frantically looking for blue troops to defend the hill. Warren helps drag two guns of Hazlitt's artillery battery to the crest of the hill. He also caught a brigade on its way to reinforce Sickles. This brigade agrees to alter course and move to Little Round Top. The brigade commander who has taken the responsibility is Colonel Strong Vincent commander of the 3rd Brigade of the 1st Division of Sykes Corps. His four regiments assemble along the south-facing slope of Little Round Top. From west to east, the regiments of Vincent's Brigade are the 16th Michigan with 356 men under Welsh, the 44th New York with 313 men under Rice, the 83rd Pennsylvania with 308 men under Woodward, and the 20th Maine with 358 men under Chamberlain. Chamberlain has moved a company of his Maine regiment into the woods to watch for further movement around the flank. These blue regiments have just assembled as the rebels are moving up the same slope. The rebels are met with a line of rifle fire from the heights. Then they hear the groan of artillery from the top of Little Round Top. The center of the Union line is hit first. The 44th New York and 83rd Pennsylvania throw lead down the hill at the attackers. Texas and Alabama return fire. The rebels charge. They are thrown back. They charge again. They are thrown back. It is critical to understand that if any of these blue regiments fold, the whole situation will be endangered. If one of two flank regiments folds, the entire brigade will be outflanked. If one of the center regiments breaks, the rebels will cut the defenders in half. The 5th Texas, attacking here at the center, will take the heaviest casualties of all the regiments engaged here. Over half of this regiment will fall. The 4th Texas moves against the 16th Michigan in an attempt to break the Union flank. Texas hits hard. Michigan is not afforded the cover of trees as this slope is clear. Michigan begins to waver. Vincent himself goes to the flank, rallying the line. He tells the men not to give an inch. Then Vincent himself falls. As smoke and confusion engulf Little Round Top, Rice of the 44th New York takes Vincent's place at as brigadier commander. 
O'Connor assumes command of the 44th New York. Then the Yankees get a break. The 140th New York arrives. Behind them, still a distance away, is Weed's Brigade. The Union now has reinforcements arriving. The 526 men of the 140th New York under O'Rourke will stabilize the wavering Michigan line, driving back the Texans. The Union right is secure. Now Alabama begins to move against the opposite flank. The 47th Alabama hits 20th Maine. Oates maneuvers his 15th Alabama even further down the line, threatening the extreme left of the whole Union Army. The 15th hits again, moving ever further down Chamberlain's flank. The lines are at times only 10 paces apart. Chamberlain and Oates will both lose more than one-third of their men. Oates creeps further around, but Chamberlain will counter by squaring the line. Alabama hits. They're driven back. They hit again. They're driven back. The extreme angle of the Union Army is taking fire. Ammunition is low. Oates hits again. Maine holds. But another attack may be coming. Chamberlain takes a chance. Low on ammunition and unsure if he can hold another attack, he orders a charge. While Chamberlain gave the order for a right wheel sweep down the slope, in the confusion and noise, some officers claim that they can't hear the command. But even if Chamberlain's counterattack was more disjointed, the rush of the regiment barreling down the slope, combined with Company B hitting on the flank, gives the strike the effect of a sweeping right wheel. The main men tumble down the hill at the attackers. The 15th Alabama is caught off guard. The 20th Maine chases the 15th Alabama all the way up Big Round Top. Scores of prisoners are taken. Oates will be forever scarred by this day. His brother was killed in the attack. Reinforcements from Colonel Fisher's 3rd Brigade arrive to assist the 20th Maine. The 5th Pennsylvania and the 12th Pennsylvania Reserves flush out def defenders from Big Round Top. Rice has the 83rd P Pennsylvania and the 44th New York move down the slope of Little Round Top where they gather the wounded and take hundreds of weapons from fallen enemy. As night falls, the Union holds both heights. Colonel Rice, who assumed command of Little Round Top after Vincent fell, said this of the day. Although this brigade has been engaged in nearly all of the great battles of the Army of the Potomac and has always greatly distinguished itself with gallant behavior, yet in none has it fought so desperately or achieved for itself such imperishable honors as in this severe conflict of the second instant.